Today I'm going to replace the traction drive belt and attachment drive belt of my Arian snowblower, which is model 926101. It's an old snow throw from like, I don't know, 2005? It's been a few years since I've had to do this repair, so I'm making this video for my reference in case I need to do it again in a few years. If you're watching, just know I'm by no means a professional snowblower technician, but like many folks, I'm simply a DIYer trying to save a few bucks by making my own repairs. I like to do these videos in close to real time, and that way I can follow along later. Things I used for this repair include a 3 8 of an inch, half inch, and 9 16 of an inch wrenches and socket wrenches. You can also use a nut driver set for some of it. And in my case, I needed a 7 16 of an inch socket because some guy I hired to tune this thing up a few years ago replaced one of the 3 8 of an inch cap screws with a 7 16 I also used needle nose pliers, something to hold screws, nuts, and bolts. And I like to use yogurt containers gloves, a rag to wipe off hands, and of course the replacement parts listed here. I ordered the parts directly from Arians, and they were less expensive than buying them from a local shop. Shipping was free too. Just Google Arians replacement parts for snowblower and you'll find the website. On the site, you just put in your model and serial number and the parts lists show up. Select the parts you need, put them in your shopping cart, and it's just that easy. So I want to say thanks to Arians for making it simple, and that's much appreciated. On the website, you can also download a full parts manual for future reference, and that's fantastic. Before doing any repair, you want to make sure you remove any fuel from the fuel tank, since this thing will need to be put into the service position. Now to get started. Using a 3 8 inch socket wrench or nut driver, remove the two screws holding down the belt cover. I loosened them off camera, which is why I'm using fingers. I'm going to keep the background volume low because it was a really windy day and there's a lot of noise in the microphone. Lift off the cover. <laughs> Seems like it should have been easier. Luckily it's pliable. Put the machine into the service position and that's a two-handed job. Remove the wheel on the discharge chute side by removing the axle pin, and that'll give me access to two of the six cap screws securing the back panel. Remove all six cap screws, which are 3 eighths of an inch, although one of mine is 7 16 thanks repair guy back in 2015. Set the screws aside and remove the back panel. Put the wheel back on, securing it with the locking pin, and put the machine back into its operating position. Wheels on the ground. Before separating the auger attachment from the body, there are a few things to disconnect. Start by putting the discharge chute control to the middle position and the deflector lever in the lowest position, which actually raises the deflector. Remove the cover to the discharge chute gear using a 3 8 inch nut driver and then pull the clip pin. Yeah, that happened. I'm apparently working with Mr. Butterfinger today. And I'll need to remove the discharge chute lock cable, but since I'm already here, uh, I'll disconnect the deflector cable. Since I only had one free hand, I used a brick to hold down the deflector. Disconnect the cable from the top, and it just slides out. With needle nose pliers, squeeze the gray plastic stop and pull the cable down through the holder. Now 
Now to remove the discharge chute lock cable. To get it out, the front screw needs to be unscrewed all the way, and then the ball can clear the spring-loaded locking mechanism. I'll show you how this thing works later, since it usually requires adjustment at the end. I screw the nut back on just a little, that way I don't lose it. Now to go back to the control panel. With needle nose pliers, remove the hairpin of the discharge chute rod under the control panel. You can see the top of the hairpin here. It can be a bit tricky to get out, but I was able to pull it out with my fingers. Removing the pin disconnects the rod from the discharge chute rotation lever. Once that's done, now I can pull back on the discharge chute rod so that it's no longer connected to the gears. Remove the belt finger using a half inch socket wrench. Now to detach the attachment drive belt. The point here is to make sure the belt is separated from the engine sheave, which is attached to the back of the unit. I usually leave it wrapped, I usually leave the belt wrapped around the attachment pulley because that's attached to the front piece of the unit. And all this has to be done in order to separate the unit. You don't want the belt caught between the two sections. Before the next step, which is separating the unit, make sure the back and front of the unit are properly supported. You might want to get a helper to hold the handlebars um, or use something to prop them up, as well as have uh, something in there to prevent the wheels from rolling. I used a 4x6 to prop up the attachment, but I neglected to secure the handlebars, so you'll see. It comes crashing down. To separate the two sections on this model, there are two 9 16 of an inch hex bolts that need to be removed. There's one on each side. Since the wheels are in the way, this requires a wrench instead of a ratcheted socket. This is where a second set of hands is definitely helpful. Wait for it. <laughs> yeah, that happened. Here's a look at how the sections connect, which is pretty nifty. The front piece hooks onto the bar there. Now, if you're just replacing the attachment drive belt, check out the information section below to jump to reconnecting the attachment drive belt. I need to change the traction drive belt, so there's more to do. To get to the traction drive belt, 
you need to remove the stop bolt on the frame and remove a few springs. To make it easier, pull out the tire a little to get some clearance, and then I use a 3 8 of inch socket wrench to loosen the stop bolt. That'll provide clearance to get the belt behind the drive plate assembly. Remove the spring between the traction drive belt idler and the frame. Remove the spring between the drive plate assembly and the frame. Get my new traction drive belt. This is an OEM part, and it's made in the US. Bonus. And to get it on, it needs to go behind the drive pulley, then around it, and up over the engine sheave. And it's a bit tricky with one hand since it requires lifting the drive pulley to get the belt between the drive pulley and friction disc. Getting a better angle. <laughs> I'm using the discharge chute as a tripod. There we go. Once I put the spring back on the traction drive belt idler, it'll increase the tension on the belt. Reattach the spring between the traction belt idler and frame. And I was going to do this off camera since it requires two hands, but I was determined, so I pressed on. Reattach the spring between the drive belt assembly and the frame. and tighten up the stop bolt. This little clip here is irrelevant to the video. I'm just replacing a missing clip that stabilizes the rod attached to the drive plate assembly. It may be why my drive belt actually broke. I ordered this part directly from Arians too.
Now to put the wheel back on. Just so you can see how this works, when the traction drive clutch lever is held down, the friction disc makes contact with the traction drive pulley, which ultimately makes the wheel spin. Now to reassemble this rusty beast. All right, be sure to have a second pair of hands or something to stabilize the sections once they come together. So, well, <laughs> you'll see what happens. I end up grasping for anything to keep this thing from falling. Luckily, there were some garbage cans nearby. So you wanna bring the sections together and make sure the attachment drive belt is over the attachment pulley, or else you're gonna have your hands full trying to juggle a snowblower while getting the belt in place. You'll get the clips on the front of the unit onto the bar, um, and I'm gonna speed up some of these, well, this, this next section, because it's kind of embarrassing. Although, I'm only gonna speed it up a little because I wanna have a good laugh next time I see it. The thing was starting to get heavy at this point, so I started grabbing for anything I could to prop it up. Freaking out here. Thank goodness for that garbage can. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't collapse. Since I couldn't get the two sections together with one hand, I got one of the bolts in off camera. Before I put the 9 16 7 inch hex bolts back in, on both sides. I wiped them off and gave them a little coat of Vaseline. It's just an old trick my dad taught me. The petroleum jelly keeps bolts from rusting. This is the bolt I started off camera. I'll just tighten it up. Now to reattach the attachment drive belt. Here I try to get the belt around the engine sheave and inside the attachment belt idler, but it's not gonna work. So it's best to put the snowblower back into the surface position, which is what I end up doing. And yep, I lifted that with one hand. And to get the attachment drive belt around the attachment pulley, you pull down on that piece that has the attachment brake shoe pad on it, uh, just to get it started. And again, I needed my other hand to do this, so it's gonna be done off camera. Once the belt's on the attachment pulley, put the machine back into the operating position and put the attachment belt on the front of the engine sheave and inside the attachment belt idler. When the attachment clutch lever is engaged, the belt becomes taut. It will also be held in place once we reattach the belt fingers, which is the next step. So reattach the belt fingers and the bolts are a half inch and I've coated them with Vaseline.
reattach the discharge chute lock cable, and this will require some adjustment later. So you understand how it works, the lock cable lifts the spring-loaded latch that has teeth and the teeth connect into the gear in front of it. For now I'll just get the front screw started. Now I'm going to slide the discharge chute rod forward so the first hole comes through and I'll put the clip back in. I'm going to put the cover back on here, although I should have left it off since it's going to require adjustment. Before I finish with the discharge chute, because I still have to put the hairpin into the rod underneath the control panel, I reattach the deflector cable. Now to put the hairpin into the rod under the attachment discharge chute rotation lever. That's under the control panel. This is not easy, uh, especially with one hand, and it requires lining up the holes in the rod with the holes in the handle. Now to adjust the discharge chute locking cable, since it's not moving at all. And let me explain how it works. Moving the handle pulls the cable as to unlock the spring lever downstream. It basically requires adjusting both ends so the cable's taut enough to pull the release downstream. Ultimately, I had to shorten both ends to get it taut, and it requires a little trial and error.
At this point, before putting the back panel and belt cover back on, it's a good idea to give this thing a test run just in case further adjustments are needed. I propped up the wheels for the video's sake and I moved the locking pins into the center of the wheels. You might want to do that as well. And uh, I put some gas in. The gas was probably a year and a half old, but it starts right up. You want to check the traction drives working properly and also check that the auger is working properly. Did I just drive it into the wall? Now to replace the back cover and belt cover and prepare for the white stuff. Happy holidays, everyone. If this video has been helpful, please do me a favor and like it. More importantly, please subscribe since that's what keeps the channel going. Thanks for watching. You're shut down.